Great, thank you. It's great to see you again, and thanks for putting this on. It's a lot of effort to do all this and get all these speakers to come around, and thanks to ASAP uh, for really hosting us and, and all the families here. It's just really a great tribute and dedication to the patients we're discussing, you know, in all our talks, as well as those you have in mind here today, and hope at the breaks we can chat more individually about cases. That's the fun part for us to kind of think through this, and these are very challenging. I'm sorry to be an expert on failures. Um, this is not <laughs> something I'd aspired to, but uh, this is a really difficult topic, you know, because we don't have the answers. You know, there are a lot of things that were brought up this morning, and uh, Benny just talked about, you know, some syrinxes didn't get better. You know, why is that? You know, wh why do we do these surgeries and, you know, the syrinx didn't change? You know, is that a technique issue? Is that a patient issue? What, what, what can we do as surgeons? You know, we're quite limited. And we have to remember that surgery is not the only answer. There's a lot that goes through thinking about these patients, and they're very complicated. Once you've had surgery, it only becomes even more difficult to think what next, you know, in these patients. We now do this uh, work at Stanford through REDCap, which is a big database that we put families through about 45 minutes on an iPad to, to go through symptoms and cognitive effects. You know, there's so much in Chiari. If you really start asking questions, it's way beyond just the headaches and the cough with headaches, that sort of thing, Valsalva headaches. It, there's much more going on. And um, highlighted this morning with those tractography studies before and after surgery, there are changes happening in the brain way above the cerebellum. You know, there are circuits if you look in the neuroscience world, the cerebellum's connected to the top of the brain through many different pathways, speech, language, memory. So we don't really quite understand sort of the tonsils of the cerebellum and how that might relate to, to other things that we think about. So the biggest, I think, thing we have to understand and grapple with and I know is how do we define failure? I think we have to think through that first because we can't just go to how to fix failures you know, does that mean they have headaches again or neck pain? Well, that, that's a common complaint, right? That was one of the primary issues, and they may have gotten better, then they're worse again. And when we go through this evaluation in the clinic, you know, it, there's a lot of continuity of care after surgery that really should happen, and those of us here get that. But you go beyond the sort of non chiari community, you look at the scan, you're cured, you're fixed. You know, but unfortunately, it's not so simple. There's this minority, and it luckily is a minority. It's just not the dominant group. It's just like concussion, when we're talking about concussions in the clinic. Most concussions get better, you know. It, but these some QRI patients that clearly are very challenging, very difficult, have ongoing issues, unfortunately, that are disabling over their life, with or without a syrinx. So they might have weakness or numbness that might come and go, sometimes with a syrinx, sometimes without. You know, we have to put this in context. Scoliosis, is that a marker of failure? You know, sometimes say the scoliosis improved. Sometimes there's no syrinx and the scoliosis got better after Chiari surgery. We don't quite understand that too much, but it, it happens. But if it gets worse again, is that a failure? You know, that, that what has happened with that? Is there a neuromuscular problem? Is there something else beyond what we're seeing you know, we need to keep an open mind. I think that was said earlier about these patients and being atypical. We have to be very careful about them uh, because there are some things that we see that we previously maybe did not attribute to Chiari that have gotten better, but then they maybe get worse again. And how does that make sense? The syrinx is, is difficult. You know, is that our only sign of failure? If you look at the Chiari 2 population, you know, very different than Chiari 1, which is really the focus of of this conference. Um, Chiari 2 and sp open spina bifida, meningomyelocele, their syrinxes oscillate, and we've, we've followed that. The syrinxes come up and down, and those of us that are in spina bifida clinics, we see that. And we don't, the patient's asymptomatic, but the syrinx will come up, next scan is down. You know, that, that's a little frustrating because it, it gives us a sense there's a lot happening that we don't see. We don't scan patients, you know, weekly, right? We scan them periodically. Very arbitrary, six months, one, one year, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but this is difficult. What are we looking for in imaging? 
And we've all been discussing that today about the cerebellum and slumping down. We hate to see that. Common in kids, particularly with a bad connective tissue problem, like a Noonan syndrome. You know, we see this sort of sagging despite what we do. And how do we deal with that at a young age? Um, very young kids, of course, can regrow bone and they have to redo things or, you know, but as you get older, you know, the chance of having to do something again is very low, but when you do, it, it's a big deal. I mean, going back in on these patients is a much greater undertaking, you know, than the first time, unfortunately. There's a lot of scarring maybe at the craniocervical junction inside the dura. Well, that haunts us. The more we go in to take down scar, this is true with anything we do, we're going to cause more scarring. So we're very sensitive to that. Can we do better and change the natural history? We can maybe get that patient better for a period of time, but how do we fix them? You know, that, that, that's really the, the challenge, I think, as surgeons we address. Things are temporary. You know, we like permanent, more permanent solutions. Um, the shunt, we think, maybe a permanent solution, say, for a CSF disorder, right? Uh, as opposed to taking down little webs or something. But how do you deal with that at the craniocervical junction when unfortunately the real estate under us is serious? This is brainstem, medulla, you know, pons. These are areas that are life-threatening if we breach those areas and cause harm and affect the many vessels in there, these arteries and veins that are critical to that area. Some patients have pseudomeningoceles and some have had scarring inside because of aseptic meningitis and problems with how they healed from the first time. And they have that history. And that's a setup for problems later. You know, we see that in patients down the road and you always go back to that first surgery, you know, kind of what happened. What happened, say, with this initial, you know, decompression? Oh, gee, sorry. Um, must be a laser here. You know, classic Chiari, we fix it, but what's happening inside the dura. All of the surgeons here probably do a little bit different operation to fix this. You know, we might all open the dura maybe or may not. We might buzz the tonsils. Some might take the tonsils and chop them out. You know, various levels of aggression in terms of what to do. There's only one right answer. That's Dr. Keating. He's always got the answer, the wisdom, you know, but we really just don't don't know in terms of what, what we're doing and what we're setting up for the future. But this kind of issue of looking at CSF flow or what is our signal as we look at failure, you know, what are we going to look at to say, oh, they need another operation? I think that's very difficult. And that threshold should be high to take someone back to surgery to fix something on redos. These are sort of redo images of patients that, you know, they basically look almost the same as when they started. How could that be? You know, they had a nice decompression. They had really good room in there. Things were moving. We have good CSF flow. How can it look right back to where it started? And these are teenagers or young adults. You know, what is happening that makes that, you know, change? Even if there's nothing pushing anything down, as was talked about, there's no hydrocephalus. There's nothing pulling from below. This is this whole tethered cord, occult issue that Personally, I always get a total spine MRI on patients before I operate on them. I think it's a pediatric thing, you know, but do our adult partners do that? Rare. I think it's not sort of standard to do that, but it's something that you're going to miss stuff, you know, and you least expect it. And this can definitely affect your recovery and cause a failure or return of symptoms, particularly in that adolescent or young adult patient. You know, the whole fatty phylum question, you can have fat in this band of phylum that pulls the spinal cord down. Very controversial area. Do we deal with that? Whether the spinal cord's low or not. Lipomyomeningoceles, these are fatty areas in the spinal cord that you were born with that's pulled the spinal cord down. Sinus tracts, we saw a patient, 40-year-old with a dimple, never had an MRI scan, but had to find to have a Chiari what happened, got the Chiari fixed, no one looked at her back, had a dermal sinus tract pulling the spinal cord down since birth. I mean, something that we may have fixed that first and may not have addressed the Chiari. Did she have Chiari symptoms? No, almost mostly had neck pain, upper back pain. But, you know, these are difficult to sort out unless we really look at the entire CNS axis, which is brain, you know, and spine. 
And then some people have this Chiari 2-like appearance where the brain looks very much like a Chiari 2 with, with the sloping of this tentorium in the back of their brain. You know, very different appearance. You know, but they're still Chiari 1. They've never had a history of open spinal bifida. They clearly don't do as well, those patients. And just like the Chiari 1.5 patients, if you hear about, these classifications where the brain stem's sagging, the tonsils are sagging, they're a little bit more evil, for sure, in terms of the follow-up, the natural history, with or without surgery, syrinx, no syrinx, they definitely have more trouble. But how do we tease that out in the beginning? How do we make predictions? Because every family wants to know, you know, what, do we have to have this again? A lot ask, do, should we do this preventatively? Because at some point it's needed, let's get it over with. You know, we don't do that. We, we, if they're asymptomatic, we, we're very comfortable watching these scans, at least without a syrinx. I have gotten a little bit more conservative over time and even watching small syrinxes. Someone completely asymptomatic, not the ones that we were showing earlier, big syrinxes, but this is on the panel, we can maybe get into this. But these occult tethered cords can, can haunt us with the spinal cords going all the way to the bottom. You know, that's not normal. And that, you know, was picked up later, and these are kids, but same thing, they can pull the Chiari down, so we think of this more of a secondary Chiari 1. But this is a source of failure if you don't recognize it up front. So we have to take some of this out, these acquired Chiaris, which only get worse, you know, with time. Just some cases as we go along. This is a football player, had bad headaches after a tackle, had a Chiari 1 malformation, symptoms got better after the MRI scan. Maybe the MRI scan cured him. I don't know <laughs> what happened, but, you know, by the time they come to see you, he's fine. You know, very tight Chiari. How many in the room, at least the surgeons here or medical doctors would let him, let him play football. You let him play. Yeah, he was asymptomatic. I mean, he's doing fine. You know, professional, college, high school. Tough call. We don't really know, right? We, we don't really know, but the natural history of that is pretty good. You know, the chance of something catastrophic happening is rare, but has it been reported? Do we see it? Unfortunately, yes, we do see that. So, <laughs> It's, it's, you know, a little bit rolling the dice, hoping for the best, but, you know, then he started getting symptoms and, you know, maybe he was psychosomatic. Now he has it and he's starting to think through all these different headaches he's getting and all. So, you know, we fix these things and um, I know it's not lunchtime yet, so we can show these. Um, but, you know, after the tonsils were rounded up, you know, he's got a lot more room in there, but he's still crowded, this kid. I mean, he still has big tonsils, and you can only make it look so good. He clearly wants to play sports again at a very high level, this kid. This is not someone that is going to play for a little bit. This is a varsity athlete, high, high chance for scholarship athlete, you know, for college. You know, these are difficult scenarios of what are we setting him up for in the future. Clearly, he was getting more symptoms. He was getting much worse, you know, getting out of school, things like that, really making it hard. He couldn't play football because he was so symptomatic. But we, we sat on him for about 18 months before we decided to do something. The only thing I'll mention in terms of failures, you know, coming back on some kids where it is horrendous in terms of the scarring is when there was a lot of dissection between the two tonsils, I think is a dangerous place to mess with. I think creating raw tissue planes there and causing scarring can get these kids into trouble. Our whole goal when we go back in is to make sure we get good CSF flow again. And it is really tough when these tonsils stick together. And they usually stick together because there was a lot done between the tonsils. Sometimes the tonsils are removed or not. It doesn't matter. But if there's a lot of dissection there, again, more work done inside the dura, I think it, it, it sets these kids up for potential failures and down the road. And we, you know, it's not a scientific study here, but it's a personal observation from having done you know, some of these down the road, which are really difficult surgeries to do and at much higher risk than the first surgery. So we decompressed him. Like very few wanted him to play football. Is everyone agreeing now? He has a good MRI, no syrinx. We're all going to let him go back now to play? Only Dr. Keating. <laughs> you wouldn't. Yeah. But this is tough. You know, are we going to create a failure by letting him go back? 
This is something, you know, is he going to get symptomatic? Because now we're going to push him to the edge of play. And we can comment on this in the panel. Some of this is meant to be provocative for Dr. Vez, so we can discuss these things later. 16-year-old um, soccer player, burning dysesthesias, both arms, OK, after heading the ball, common in soccer. Workup, of course, had a big syrinx. Chiari, you can't quite see, I'm sorry. Um, symptoms improved, had a Chiari decompression. Symptoms came back two years later. Syrinx totally collapsed, looked beautiful. But the symptoms came back. Why is that? Well, this is a failure. You know, something, what happened? Well, the syrinx went away. You know, we're happy. MRI looks great, very reassuring. But the patient's having a lot of trouble. You know, so this raises this whole question of, well, maybe the syrinx was there for years. You know, what did that do to the spinal cord? You know, there's a lot of issues with this that we face if you follow these patients long term. This is not a quick release, done, you know, come back in 10 years. These patients can have trouble, and you have to ask them the questions to, you know, now she's on medication, you know, really good in terms of the craniocervical junction, nicely decompressed, six more MRIs. The MRI numbers start going up because the symptoms are going up. We keep hoping to find something. They're just not giving us our answer. At Stanford, doing so much imaging, to pushing that the physics envelope trying, like as mentioned, at Akron and at Idaho to look at that whole question of we got to do better with imaging. We're missing it. You know, we're really trying to put more effort to get our radiology colleagues and physicists into this because we got to get some more answers objectively to help these patients. A lot more neck pain, which became truly disabling for her. You know, what is going on? Uh, can't play soccer anymore, that's for sure. And this pops up. And I put it in bold in the largest font I could think of because this is haunting us now. I mean, even Chiari patients coming in for the first visit, they all think they have EDS because of the social media. It's really a difficult issue, way overdiagnosed. Very few actually probably have it, but there are clear signs and clinical signs to look for in EDS, and there are talks on this. But our geneticists at Stanford don't want to deal with these patients. They're saying, well, we have nothing to offer. There's no specific genetic mutations anyway. So I said, well, can you please look at them? You know, they, they're clearly floppy, and they look at the, what their hands can do. You know, they're a setup for problems. We're worried about this with, in the setting of Curie 1, but they're really doing this to look, rule out other things. You know, there's lots of syndromes of connective tissue disorders. <laughs> But they definitely can affect our, our patients, you know, with Chiari. And we don't really understand yet where this goes, but it, it right now is a, it's a hot area in Chiari. And we have to hit this head on. We have to deal with this and understand it better. But many patients want to know, how does it affect our surgery? Do we have more failures in the EDS patients? I would say, no question, they're going to have more issues if we look into those patients. But this is the problem with craniocervical instability. How do we pick that up in a patient? This is difficult. You can do flex X x-rays. Rarely do they show anything, unless it's fluid instability. You know, I like the dynamic MRI. We do MRIs in different positions, flexion, extension, neutral, easy on an awake patient. A sleep patient, you've got to be very careful. We don't get them into trouble. Um, but sometimes that can show dramatic instability at the craniocervical junction. And I didn't really see it before. I did a lot more dynamic MRIs to look at the brain stem, look at that, the ligament in front of the brain stem, see how everything is moving in time. And I hope that with imaging, we can get much more functional over dynamic imaging like we do for other things in the brain. And Chiari is kind of like a fixed image or CSF flow, but we're missing the, the boat of other things that we could clearly do in these patients. Um, we, we try collar trials. We, you know, sometimes it's traumatic, you know, putting them in a collar. That patient I showed you, the soccer player, went in a collar. All these symptoms in her arms got better. Her neck got better, of course, too, but all the arm symptoms got better. Again, her MRI looks normal now. So how do, how do you put that together? Uh, she also had an occipital nerve block, which sometimes can help, you know, because of the occipital neuralgia in these patients. Another patient, six-year-old with progressive headaches, bad Chiari headaches, classic, blurry vision. 
and the eye exam showed papal edema, which is optic nerve swelling. So we're worried about CSF pressure and some visual field loss, right? Losing vision, not a good thing. Something's going to have to happen. Very tight Chiari in the back. I'm sorry, these the radiologists do this to us. You know, they, they stick these things on there, but then you can't see anything you know, underneath them. It's quite annoying. But um, this is the brain. does not show any hydrocephalus. So what do you do with this kid? Well, you know, you can do ICP monitoring, and I've done that on some of these kids. Usually it's normal. How do you explain that? Papal edema, pretty normal ICP, six, eight. You know, but this kid's losing vision. Tight Chiari. So what do you do? Do you shunt the kid? Do you put in, do you do the Chiari decompression? You know, this is this whole pseudotumor issue, which is again related to failure of Chiari because the headache issue, the CSF pressure haunts these patients and they can have a lot of issues. Diamox, et cetera, can be helpful in diuretics. Um, but the, the neat thing is that, you know, doing the Chiari decompression actually everything seems to calm down. The, the pressures seem to normalize. This pressure is in a very different compartment. It's not in this little monitor that you can put in the brain. It's CSF pressures down the spine that you pick up. And maybe the spine's not communicating with the head. That makes it challenging. And for failures, this becomes even more difficult after a decompression trying to interpret some of these findings. This talks about endoscopic third ventriculostomies. We haven't talked too much about it, but instead of shunting, can you do something to divert fluid under the brain into the subarachnoid space? Well, that patient I showed you would be pretty difficult. You know, these ventricles are tiny. It could be hard to do much of anything in there. Um, but this is something that, you know, does haunt us in terms of Chiari. We know it's associated with Chiari. We know some of these pressures are elevated before decompression. We don't measure it. We don't often do spinal taps on Chiari patients, right? We think it can make them worse, sucking things down from below. You know, it's not a good thing, you know, if they're trapped up above. But many of these patients have low-lying tonsils. The overlap of symptoms is very much the same sometimes. So how do you put all that together? You know, some of the headaches aggravated by Valsalva could be a pseudotumor, Chiari, you know, so these, these are tough, and when you've had a decompression already, it gets even harder to figure out those next steps. Hydrocephalus, I'm not going to dwell on. We, we've talked about that. Clearly, if there's hydrocephalus, we're going to shunt the patient, but we're always wondering, what are they symptomatic from? And do you just deal with this, and that will go away? Will dealing with this help that? Well, that's the scenario I just talked about, but there was no hydrocephalus. That was the pseudotumor. But there are many patients with ventriculomegaly that we see. Pediatric side, this is common. The ventricles are up. They're not normal. And we might decompress the Chiari, and sometimes those ventricles come down. Sometimes they go up, though. It might affect their absorption. So how do we predict that? Patients, I'm worried. I always put a little drain in the ventricles if they're pretty big after the decompression because I don't want them to leak. Those pressures are usually very low. I don't know what other people think, but they've been with ventriculomegaly where their vein, the brain actually looks pretty good except the ventricles are just dilated. Um, they, you know, they, they seem to get away pretty well with that and sometimes that gets better. We improve the fourth ventricular outlet under the Chiari and things can improve. And that's, that's been shown in these papers where things reverse. Another patient, 15 year old with neck pain. Um, again, got better by the time of Time came to see us. Great. Didn't even want to come to the clinic visit. Kind of like the scans showed this morning a couple times. Tight Chiari. We don't like that bulge of the brain stem. You know, things are really difficult here. Chiari 1.5 malformation. Big syrinx. Asymptomatic. She has, a, of course, the state championships coming this weekend. A lot on the line. Star soccer player. Okay. A goalie. What are you going to do? Let her play? I mean, this, this is the dif difficulty we have in terms of what to do. Very tight, extensive syrinx, very wide. You can see here, that, and look at the craniocervical junction. You know, we're getting better and better at looking at this area. We study this and stare at it for a long time now to try to understand it's not just this, right? There's a lot going on in the front that we pay attention to. 
And if, if Arnold Menezes was here, he would spend a good three, three or four hours just on that alone. Um, you know, this is the, the odontoid that's kicked back up against the brain stem. There's a thick ligament here that can get even bigger with instability. There's a lot going on right at this place here. And sometimes you're going to follow the bone going very horizontal. You know, all this happens development at a very similar um, gestation, and which is why a lot of this all goes together. But these changes can all get worse. And, you know, do you have to do something up front, or can you get away with just a decompression? This conversation is going to be a lot more than just the first kid with that tight Chiari. There's a lot more going on here that is going to worry me for more risk for failure on these patients. And then the risk of opening the dura this is perfect follow-up to what Dr. Iskandar just talked about, you know, the risk of opening or not. You know, this kid, would anyone just do a bone-only decompression and not open the dura? And, you know, we, we weigh more toward opening with such big syrinxes. We've excluded big syrinxes in our studies because we, we are biased toward, well, we got to get that syrinx down. It was kind of the medium syrinxes that we included in that Park Reeve study. Not the teeny ones, but the medium ones. Um, you know, but they're inadequate decompression. They're not going to get better. Um, this is what we're always worried about post-surgery, still having symptoms. Well, they're not well decompressed. That, that's one of the most common things we see. We thought we decompressed them, but they don't look decompressed. But we wait. We watch them, and, and things with time can improve, actually, and look a little bit better. So we, we don't jump to say, oh, we got to go back in. It looks tight still. No, we're going to sit tight and kind of watch. But is that a failure, or is that a failure of our technique? And we can also overdo this. We can over-decompress the patient. If we open up the entire posterior fossa and things just kind of sag, that's a setup for trouble you know, in these patients. And then you have to reverse the Chiari, and you've probably heard about that, titanium plates and things. That's where it gets difficult in terms of how to deal with that and undo the decompression that we've done because we've overdone it. So we're very sensitive to just kind of doing just enough but not overdoing it. And then, you know, trying to figure out response in terms of duraplasty or not and basing that decision and the risk for failure in the future. Well, risk for failure is higher if we don't do a duraplasty, we think. You're going to have to redo a certain percentage of those. That, that's clear in the literature. But we're also opening them up to new problems. You know, a pseudomeningocele, the aseptic meningitis, which may have other implications, like I talked about, in terms of setting you up for that scarring. So we are worried about that. So this patient underwent an open decompression and duraplasty, and people talk about the height of the bone and how much is enough. You know, just enough, but not too much, right, we were talking about. C1 is often always taken out. I personally really try to leave C2. Even if those tonsils go under it, we tr it's a lot of ligaments and whatnot around C2. I think the, just even the pain alone is much higher if we disrupt a lot of the, the muscles and ligaments around C2. And then three months later, still has some, some symptoms. The syrinx didn't get any better. Well, that's concerning. You know, we just did this whole thing. The syrinx is the same. Well, what do we do? We're different. You know, do we observe it? Well, maybe it takes longer. Well, we were just sort of hoping here that it, the next scan is going to look better. Do we go back because we missed something? Maybe we missed a veil on the fourth ventricle. We always look for that. But what could we do different? If we didn't do it, say someone else did it down the street, we always think we can do it better. Well, unlikely. You know, we can go back, but it, it's rare to find something like, oh, wow, that wish we'd seen that the first time. So we're really worried about these patients. You know, then we might have to shunt them. We already looked at their whole spine. You know, we don't think there's a tethered cord, which can haunt these syrinxes. Um, you know, what if you do have a tethered cord? What do you do first and second or same time? You know, a lot of questions come up that we talk about, you know, at our meetings. And, or do you have to decompress and fuse these kids because they're just getting worse, they're floppy. They have a lot more going on than meets the eye, and, and they might we need a fusion because they just the syrinx is not going away. Um, th these are the difficult scenarios where that syrinx is not resolving, where you know, that's a failure of either us diagnosing or in our technique. Something's not right. Why we can't get that syrinx down? It, it, 
And I still go back to the craniocervical junction. Something is not right at the craniocervical junction. Um, and if you set up for leak problems, this is uh, a study I did back when we had some issues with leaking because certain grafts we're using and glues. And there's a lot of stuff we use in surgery that can all relate to one another and mix with each other. And, and there were some products that we had used that caused such inflammation, high spinal fluid pressures, aseptic meningitis, you know, that we had to clearly change what we were doing. And we were kind of forced to do these things back then because the products changed or, you know, the companies folded. We had to change products, you know. But thing, everything we use has risk in terms of, something, you know, in terms of affecting the spinal flow. Um, and then changing the graft might be the answer. It's very unusual that someone's rejecting the graft. That comes up a lot. You know, maybe the graft is the evil, but the leak can do it for sure because there's a mixing that's going on with the leak, a sumeningocele, and that, that can really haunt this patient for setups for, again, more scarring and more failures down the road. Um, so. How much time do we have um, for Arrow? You're going to kick me off soon. Five more minutes, or is that negative? That's negative. I'm already in the red. So I'm just going to go to the end here to uh, um, we can discuss these in the panel if you want. But um, the, the one thing I, I spilled over there is don't miss the patient with the CSF leak. You know, we always are worried about that, particularly in the young adults where they have they're, after a trauma particularly, they have a problem with a nerve root sleeve or something, they're leaking CSF. And we do see changes in the brain that are very classic for that, that we don't want to miss that patient. That's not a patient you want to do a Chiari decompression on. We fix the leak and they hopefully get better and that, that can be done more minimally invasive. And there's a talk on that, I'm not going to dwell too much on it. But we're always scanning the whole brain and spine. We're looking for all these things carefully. A lot of attention here where I hope we can with research and, and ASAP, we can really push this envelope to get better at looking at that. We're always looking in the eyes. Getting the eye doctors involved is crucial, you know, because of the CSF pressure and how that relates to failure and symptoms. We're always thinking about how to do flexion extension studies and getting your radiology colleagues to do this is not trivial. because It takes more time. They don't like it. It adds time to the scanner because they've got to put it in three different positions. They can't bill for it. They don't like it. <laughs> um, spinal taps, you know, how do we deal with the pressures that we get from that um, in terms of what to do? So I'll end that, but maybe we can talk more with Dr. Uh, Iskandar and, and Dr. Vez in the panel. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>